It's going to be a very interesting hour, validating many things we've been talking about secondhand and anecdotally for years and years, about the imposter in chief, the man occupying the Oval Office. Who is he? Who was he? And for the first time, someone who actually went to high school with this guy has stepped forward to tell her story of what it was like to be around Barry Satoro now Barack Hussein Obama, and what he was like for real, not as the fictional stories of his young years were laid out to tell us. Her name is Mia Pope. Uh, she is uh, a remarkably courageous woman. She is a Christian, and she was on Pastor James David Manning's program, oh, I don't know, a week or so ago, and I was able to, to get that video, and I posted it for all of you to look at, and Pastor Manning was kind enough to uh, set this up tonight so she could come on this program and speak directly to all of you. And I'm very grateful for that, Mia. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks, Jeff, for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to give the story. Uh, you know, I think uh, we as Americans, we need to get some clarity about some things, and I'm I'm thrilled to be able to clear up what I am able to clear up. Um, one thing, just to uh, stipulate uh, that I did not attend Punahou with Barry Sotoro. I was a girl in the neighborhood uh, in 77, 78, part of 79, and I only ran across him during the summertime sure. when he but, would be uh, yeah. out of school and I would be out of school. Yeah. So, um, you know, just to be specific about that, because I'm hoping that other people from Punahou and, and the neighborhood will pop yeah. up and substantiate some of this so i you know i don't want them to feel right. like well wait a minute she didn't go to Puno. but well um, what i meant to say and i should have been more specific was that you went to school at the same time in the same neighborhood and knew him that way and that's that's fine and maybe somebody from Punahou will step forward first of all let's let's talk just for fun about Punahou. um he he entered Punahou under very unusual circumstances according to tradition. Did he not? Yeah, the, that's right. The, the school is over 100 years old. It's an old missionary school. And um, it's, it's one of very few in the country, I'd say a handful of uh, preparatory-type academies in the country uh -huh. that's not only extremely expensive, but the admissions process is quite selective. And you might see some of these types of schools on the East Coast, and those familiar with that would maybe understand the incredible hoop that you have to jump through to get into these schools. Yeah. But one of the um, one of the characteristics of Punahou, of which I'm aware of, is that they really will only take you from kindergarten. You, and there's you, a whole yeah. rationale behind that. In in Barry Sotoro's case, uh, from what you know, if, if we can believe anything, but uh, he was supposedly. I uh, went 10 years old, so that would put him at about the 5th grade or maybe 11 years old in the 6th grade. Uh -huh. They wouldn't want a student coming in at that age simply because a child that age would bring other influences, their experiences and that sort of thing. And, you know, if you have a rogue kid in there, you know, it can kind of infect the other kids. So there's like a, they have this kind of a philosophy where they really kind of prefer to groom you from kindergarten on. Understand. So, and there's, yeah. there's a waiting list to get into that school. Yeah. There's no shortage of students. So if you figure that each one of those classes is full, so for Barry to have just waltzed into Punahou like that, and I'm just giving my testimony and those who know Punahou, and I you know, certainly know a lot of people there. Yeah. I've, I've even yeah. had a couple of boyfriends that have come from Punahou. Mm -hmm. And um, it's un really an unheard of thing. And so... Uh, you know, if, if, I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I'll bet a dollar that it has never happened before and it has never happened since. Now, that's my testimony. Well, I would, I, I would think you're quite right. I do know people who have gone there myself over the years and they've described yeah. a similar profile. It's very expensive, too, and these are 1970s dollars. What, what was it, uh, what did it cost to a month ago there? Yeah, it was, it, it, I mean, late, like, I, last time I heard a figure on Prunaho was in the middle 90s and mm -hmm. it was over of about nine hundred dollars for kindergarten 
at that time. A month. That's right. Yeah. And if I a remember, month, folks. A month. Just yeah, so you get so this is in like ninety four mm-hmm. that I recall because I had my long story, I had my nieces uh coming to live with me in Hawaii and so I thought I might try to see if I could do some because they were that age, four and five years old. Right. So I, I was pricing things. So that was the latest figure that I have. But um remembering back in the day, I think it was something like, you know, as much as six or seven hundred dollars a month. For even well, these dollars. that's a lot of money. You can multiply that yeah. by three, I'm sure, yeah. by now. So, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. not cheap. Okay, so, the I- the idea of uh, Hawaii uh, summer vacation, uh, people hanging out. Uh, it, it's not a huge area. Everybody kind of knew everybody that was socially active, right. I guess, and and that's how you got to know uh, Barry. Um, right. You you knew the fast lane types. You knew the uh, the uh, socially mobile types. How would you describe uh, his overall position in the young people's community? These are 15, 16, 17 year old kids. Yeah. Um, he floated around amongst us. There was a, uh, there was over 10 of us and less than 20 of us, you know, interacting from, you know, throughout. I didn't see Barry every single day, but I certainly saw, saw a lot of them. So he was and in your little peer on- group. You had a little peer group, and right. he was in that group. Okay. Yeah, he was he was more I'd say on the periphery. Barry had a a type of personality where he might have some acquaintance for a while, but he seemed to just either make that person mad at him, burn him off, or he he was he, he, he just like today you see that that usury type of personality. He was either you know bumming money, bumming cigarettes. Oh, he's a taker. Something off of you. He's yeah, a taker. taker. Yeah. And so what would happen is he would wear out that emotional uh, friendliness. You know, the reservoir of affection would it easily dry up with him. Uh-huh. So he would kind of float, you know, float around a bit. And so I would say that Barry really wasn't a beloved member of our peer group. He, but And another thing is the even us kids, and we weren't naive kids basically, right? Like, you know, knuckleheads like all, you know, most teenagers. Mm-hmm. But even we could tell about his pathological lying, and he would just, you know, he'd just tire you out. Okay, so he'd come on with his his, his charm, his flashy smile. Uh, yeah. I guess most of you were were uh, smoking a little bit of weed back then. Oh, yeah. I, I've never done prevalent. cocaine in my life, but mm-hmm. I definitely smoked and inhaled Pacalolo in the 70s, for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. And I even held it in for a second or two before exhaling. My goodness. But, um, right. Yeah, I know. You definitely don't want to waste that stuff. I, you know, but I, 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 somehow I wound up staying out of the the uh, hardcore drug scene myself, uh, you know, and I don't know, miracle, that why that was the case. Okay. But, um, but it was all around me, and right. there were certainly people around me that did harder drugs. Now, let's talk about Barry's sexual orientation then. I yeah. uh, I understand that you and your peer group uh, knew full well that even then he was uh, at least bisexual, if not full, fully homosexual. How did how did you how did you assay that, and 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 what did your friends think of that in your group? It, okay, you're, you're we're looking at seventy seven, seventy eight, seventy nine. This is mm-hmm. four eight. Uh, gay was a raging concept. It was uh, not. Really, it was like somewhat avant-garde, perhaps, to be gay. There was. Uh, was it kind of cool? It was kind of cool. Huh. It was All kind right. of cool. If you think, um, you know, I, I refer to the Studio Fifty Four mentality type crowd, but yeah, it was cool. Remember, AIDS is the thing that put the wet blanket on the gay community. Sure did. And that hadn't happened yet. No, it started and in uh, 76, 77 in the hepatitis B vaccine program, and, and that was... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we really didn't see the AIDS on the scene until 80 or 81. That's right. As far as, you know, the, the diagnosable type, you know, mystery of food mm-hmm. and so forth. But, um, and then remember that uh, coke, uh, the crack, I mean, excuse yeah, the crack wasn't invented yet, or at least it wasn't in the islands. So no, people were was, were snorting cocaine, but they right. they weren't cooking it and smoking it as crack. That just that just didn't happen. Didn't happen at that time, right? But there was a thing going on. Um, it was called freebasing, and what they would do is cocaine was in the powder form, and so I guess obviously it's cut with something, mm-hmm. and so it was a more intense high when they would take some baking soda and a little water 
and heat it up, and then the baking soda would appease to whatever the thing was cut with, you know, like lactose or whatever the heck they're cutting the thing with. Yeah. So it would give you like flakes of the actual pure cocaine. That's little, how you could separate the cut with the, yeah. from the real cocaine. Little and chunks. then they stick that in the pipe and smoke it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what Barry seemed to like to do. I'm not saying he never sm- started. Uh, he may very well have, but I'm just saying. Did that you guys? He, did you guys see him do this? Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you what I did see. And I, you know, I'm going back what 36 years. That's okay. Years, we understand. Years. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm doing. Um, but I recall Barry's lips used to get really dark. I mean, like three or four or five shades darker than the rest of his face. Now, there's a physiological reason for that. The cocaine residue restricts the blood flow to the tissue. Uh So when a person of color does that, the the lips get uh, Kind of purplish. Yeah. Kind of purplish, right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I remember that... (laughs) See, Barry's kind of convenient like that. He wears a sign for you when he's hitting the pie part. So uh, I remember we could always look at him and go, Ah, Barry... (laughs) In the pipe. <laughs> because there are times when his lips will be a relative similar color to the rest of his face. Mm-hmm. And then when he's hitting the old pipe, his lips get really dark. Looking at him now, uh, Mia Pope, uh, do you see evidences of uh, cosmetic surgery to his nose or his, uh, were his lips made any smaller? There's been talk you know, about that. Yeah. You know what I can tell you is that I think Barry has either had his teeth tapped or had some veneers put on. Okay. Because... His teeth weren't crooked, but... Um, they but weren't perfect like they are teeth, now. Yeah. Right, they weren't that denture perfect like they are now. And if I recall, I think his incisors, that'd be like the equivalent of a canine. You know, uh-huh. the can- they, yeah. I think I re- they stuck out more. So I All think right. that he's had some, at least what I can recognize is I think he's done something to his All right, well, that's not anything to, to damn anybody about in this day and age. No. Okay, he's right. a politician, he's a celebrity, and... Just you don't believe me? Just ask him, folks. Uh, right, right. Okay, so we we have no question about drug use, none. No, Marijuana, I mean, and, pot. And, and then yeah. I mean, he he really was pretty open because remember it was like a status symbol. I got if it. You, if you were to obtain it, it was it, it meant you had money, you had cash. But we knew because of his bragging that he was actually getting with these other gay guys, okay. homosexual men. And that's how he was obtaining the cocaine. Remember, now this, he's, bro- he's broke like we are. He's bum and changed by cigarettes or bum and cigarettes. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so, yet he's got this coke. Okay, so... He's got the now, coke, right. Uh, what, were there other young uh, gays in your group beside Barry, or was he pretty much it? Um, I'll tell you, it are, you know how these circles, you know, you have the people you usually hang out with the most. Like, say, there was 10... You know, more than 10, less than 20 of us. And sure. yes, there were some young gay uh, guys, mm-hmm. of which I got along beautifully with, you mm-hmm. know, as a female, right? Non-threatening mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know? Sure. And I, um, you, know, I, you know, I was always like friends with the fat girls and the gay guys and that sort of thing, which, you know, whatever. But um, uh, there, was, was, some, was, there was, was some, there was some gay, yeah, there was. Some was Barry gay, part, were, did Barry they hang out? Experimentally. Did they hang out together, the gays, Barry and the others? Yeah, I mostly, I saw Barry Sotoro get out of cars with older guys. Right, that's where I'm going I next. I saw him cavorting yeah. with older gay men. There was a place on Cujillo Avenue, it's spelled K-U-H-I-O, Cujillo Avenue. Mm-hmm. And it was located near where Hamburger Mary's is, so if any local people are listening, and that would be in Waikiki. There used to be a place. Now, I, at 14, 15, and 16, I still look like a baby, so you would have carded me immediately. I never could get into this place. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what it's called, but maybe some people from Hawaii can, rem- you know, jog my memory of what this place was called. But anyway, um, but Barry, he was already like 16, 17, and he would dress up in his little, you know, funky, disco, G-stringy looking. You, you've seen the pictures of him in drag, haven't you, Jeff? Yeah. So yeah, he'd okay. actually so he dress the, the he'd, okay he'd dress like that and he'd go to this place and and interface right. with these guys. Okay, this is all really remarkable. You you said somebody cut a deal for him somewhere along the line. Where do you think it might have happened? Now his his mother was there. 
And I think yeah. you saw her maybe one time, just very briefly. You never, you never yeah. engaged her. Uh, yeah, his, he his... didn't have any supervision. Neither did any of us, really. So yeah. to be fair, I didn't really see parents of most any, everybody. Any of your friends to speak of. Yeah, okay. because in the 70s, we just kind of ran wild. It was just that time uh-huh. where, you know... I, you know, little, the end part of the age of innocence or something where the parents thought, you, you know, they could just cut us loose and we'd be all right. Right. But, um, uh, now, his... And, and I'm, I'm going to say that I think I saw her, but she, there was, I never really heard anything. It, it seemed to me like he had no parental engagement. Like uh-huh. he was doing I, his I own think, thing. I think that's pretty obvious from what you've been telling yeah. us. That there really couldn't yeah. have been. The grandmother. I know his apartment building he lived in, mm-hmm. but I didn't have any interaction with the grandparents, and I it, don't recall ever seeing them. She was an investment banker, I understand. Very talented woman. She knew. Yeah. She knew the whole story. Now, when he went out to visit her, right before she she died, there were two Are you stories. About the maternal grandmother. Yes. Oh, okay. There were two stories about the maternal grandmother. One that she had cancer. Another one that she had fallen and broken her hip, and that's why she was pretty much out of sight. He visited her uh, at a, a time right before one of his big early uh, victories. And yeah. she died very conveniently. Uh, yeah. it's, I'm not saying that he was involved with that, but he, he did go out there and she did die conveniently and never yeah. stepped forward. She knew it all. She knew everything I would about imagine the guy. So. It was really no secret. Like I said, gay or you know, homosexuality was raging right before AIDS. Cocaine was flying around. Uh-huh. It was avant-garde stuff. So, very, my opinion wasn't trying very hard. <laughs> now, remember, he compartmentalizes. So, I think if he was on the campus of Punahou, he was keeping his cards close to his chest. But when he thought he was around people that couldn't affect him, you know, because he knew we wouldn't be on, you know, in the fall going to school with him. Right. Then, you know, so so she must have. Uh, but I will tell you, there's. I'm not saying that Barry's had only three boyfriends that have mysteriously been murdered. I only have found three of them, and then, I, and certainly Barry's had more than three boyfriends. He was never nearly that chaste. But um, if you want to talk about people who have mysteriously been murdered and they're unsolved crimes, and to this day the cases are still open, I have. Three of Barry's boyfriend's names. If you want me to share them with you, yeah, let's uh, let's do that. Okay, so one um, one boyfriend. Now these were all attendees of that Re- Jeremiah Wright Church in Chicago. Yeah, there was a um, there was a, a, a formal informal knowledge amongst the congregation that there was what they called the Down Low Club. Down now, Low. What the Down Low Club yeah. was is that where men who wanted to appear to be straight but wanted to still have the opportunity within a somewhat protected like environment to hook up with other men. Now, one of the boyfriends that I have the most information on, he was his name is Donald Young. And he was murdered uh, December 23rd, 2007 in his apartment, of which there were no signs of forced entry. So it appears that Donald had opened the door to somebody he knew. Him. Yeah. Now, what was I thought a little striking was that he died of multiple gunshot wounds, basically to the base, you know, in his chest, and, you know. So it didn't look like hitman. You know what I mean? Like, because you can actually survive those kinds of injuries sometimes. So you know, you think if it, it was wasn't a it wasn't a high class professional job. In other words, I would. It just didn't appear because. You mm-hmm. figure if the guy, if guy mm-hmm. survives, you know, you, you're gonna after you shoot him, you want to get out of there. If the guy survives, you're not even gonna know if he winds up living until mm-hmm. it's too late, and you give some description. I understand. So, so okay, so now we have the second victim, Nate Spencer. Just Nate like Spencer. Yeah. Nate Spencer, and then um, the third victim is uh, Larry Bland. That's with a B. Yeah, Larry L-B-N-D. Bland. Just yeah, so you so, know, Mia, uh, I got to know. Larry and was first to put Larry Sinclair on the radio and and Larry oh, I know. Larry we've done odd uh, 30 40 shows at least together and yeah. we've covered this uh in great detail uh yeah. he, he uh he didn't get the connection he didn't even hear about Donald Young's death until after after the fact right and right he well, figured yeah, it all out yeah 
me too, only after the death that I started to come across that information. I'm right. actually much later. And God bless you both for your efforts, because, you know, the more we shine the light on this stuff, the more, you know, that people are become, going to become empowered to, you know... Larry's, Larry's uh, courage and bravery were just simply extraordinary. They are. Absolutely. Uh, they, they, the other side, in the, in the highest levels of government, tried to drive him and did, in fact, drive him to the point where he attempted to commit suicide. And that's another story. Uh, I was involved with that, too. Uh, he called me on the air uh, just about this time uh, one night, and uh, I immediately emailed my uh, support at the network on the board, and they played a rerun, and I, I talked to Larry. He could hardly speak. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a, it was a very heartbreaking story, uh, and I was able to keep him on the air, on the phone, for 37 minutes. I remember looking at the clock. And it turns out that the local police could not find him. He was in a hotel somewhere. He had made a video and uploaded it. Uh, no one could find him. And right. he had taken what he complained about was a timed release narcotic. He said, that's all I could find. If I had been able to get the other kind, I wouldn't be talking to you. But he called to thank me and say some very nice things. And I'd, I'd never been confronted with anything like this in my life. I kept him on the phone, and it turns out that the Secret Service got involved in the last five minutes and were able to successfully ping his cell phone while he was still talking to me and got to him literally, apparently, with a couple of minutes to spare. That was it. And they got him out of there, pumped him, and stabilized him. Although he would have been gone. That's how close it was. But that's what happens when the big boys begin to put the pressure on, and they pressured yeah. him, and they beat him up verbally and on the Internet like yeah. nothing I've ever seen before, yeah. sued him for $30 million, yeah. uh, and so on. And Well, you know the story. Okay, I sure do. T and, you know, I expect uh, some significant flack myself, and I, uh, here's what I got to say. Kiss my butt, because I am not backing down off of this. I've not met, misrepresented anything, and I already made some heavy decisions. Uh, before I ever took the step, I got my spiritual life in order. Mm -hmm. I, I took stock of, you know, we all have an expiration date, okay? And I'm concerned about what type of life, you know, can I say that I led? But, you know, knowing what I know, I just felt sick to my stomach sitting there holding this information. And there's so many fellow Americans that are, you know, they're hurting, they're frustrated, they're losing their homes, they're busted down to part-time from Oskamacare, and, you know, we, and we're getting steamrolled by these super freaks, and I just got to that point where nobody, and I don't care what you call these big boys, nobody is going to take my conviction from me, I don't fear it, you could put your best investigators on me, go over me with a fine-tooth comb, have at it, um, and as far as taking threats and whatever, like I say, kiss my butt. I'm not going to stop. Well, I can tell you right now they're listening uh, to this program right Good. now. And uh, I think they heard you loud and clear. Good. It, it, it would be wonderful if, uh, if more would come forward.